Hello, my name is Tamar Friedman, Director of Peer Programs at Jewish Funders Network. And on behalf of JFN, I'm privileged to welcome you to today's special program commemorating Yom HaShoah. Today, we have the incredible opportunity to hear and learn from Dr. Edith Eager, best-selling author, psychologist, and Holocaust survivor. Dr. Eager is joined today by JFN board member, Dorothy Tenenbaum, who will interview her about her life and her journey in moving forward in light of hardship and be in conversation with her as she shares advice for all of us to take with us today. You will also have time for questions for, for all of us towards the end of our hour together. So please share your questions in the Q&A box and we will try to get to as many as possible. Before I hand it over to Dorothy to give more of an introduction and framing of the conversation, I just wanted to personally say thank you to Dr. Eager for her work and tell her that I've read both of your books, The Choice and The Gift multiple times and always get something new from it each time. And I've actually bought numerous copies to give as gifts to so many people in my life that I care about because I felt like your message and wisdom is so important to share and pass on. So thank you so much. And thank you so much for being here today. And now I'm happy to introduce Dorothy Tenenbaum to get us started. Thank you so much, Dorothy. Thank, thank you, you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you all for participating in today's program, recognizing its importance as we pay tribute to Yom HaShoah and hear from Dr. Edith Eager, a Holocaust survivor, psychologist, and author of two incredible books, The Choice and The Gift. Dr. Eager will speak about resilience and share some of what she has learned from her life and her work. As she says, her book is about the story of survival, her story of healing, and her story of the many precious people she has had the privilege of healing. But before we begin, I think it would be meaningful for me to share a few of my own words in understanding why Jewish Funders Network asked me to moderate today's program. It is amazing how sometimes you find yourself at an intersection, a crossroads, where you feel that so many experiences in your life led you to this moment. For me, this is one of those amazing moments. I am a second generation child of survivors. My mother, Esther Petersall, went through years of hell in Auschwitz-Birkenau, years that would and did make many people choose death instead of life. But growing up, all through my young years, whenever I asked my mother what helped her survive, she would answer, in life, you have decisions you must make. My choice was to survive and do everything possible to keep my younger sister alive. Those were the last words her mother said to her as she was taken to the gas chamber, take care of your sister. You can look at obstacles as dead ends or as hurdles to jump over and continue on your way. That is how my mother survived and how she leads her life and taught my brother and I. <clears throat> These words ring true today as they did then, but no one exemplifies the way of life better, more completely, more intensely, and more successfully than Dr. Eager. And there's one more additional more that I want to add. No one has used her experiences, her trials and tribulations, her gift of passion and commitment more to help choose their others choose their paths in life than Dr. Eager. If you are expecting a depressing lecture this afternoon, you are in for a shock. Wherever she goes, Dr. Eager uses her experiences in Nazi captivity to show people how to unlock the doors and go forward, not only as a survivor, but as a reviver. That's what she is, a reviver par excellence, a person who understands what mental imprisonment is all about, what searching aimlessly for a reason to live can do to your will to live. Dr. Inger brings us to the precipice and then defines the choice one must make to awaken the spirit of life that never really flickers out in any of us. And most amazingly, her energy and honesty is the lifeline that has helped so many people. The truth is, I feel I've been practicing to introduce Dr. Eager for much of my life. Thank God Dr. Eager has taken that knowledge, refined it, added to it, and made it available to everyone. 
So now it's time to begin our program. And thank you all for allowing me to share my words with you, especially Dr. Egan. So here, here we can begin. I'd like to start with a quote from your first book, The Choice, which by the way, you published at age 90. On page nine, you wrote, quote, I would love to help you discover how to escape the concentration camp of your own mind and become the person you were meant to be. I would love to help you experience freedom from the past, freedom from failures and fears, freedom from anger and mistakes, freedom from regret and unresolved grief, and freedom to enjoy the full, rich feast of life. We cannot choose to have a life free of hurt, but we can choose to be free, to escape the past, no matter what befalls us, and to embrace the possible. I invite you to make the choice to be free." End of quote. This is a very poignant statement, and I would love to spend time today discussing your life story and what has brought you to those beliefs and how you made it your life work to help people find their freedom. So Dr. Eager, the platform is yours. You're such a brilliant, wonderful interviewer and coming from the heart, the warm, loving heart. I feel very, very privileged to be be with you this morning, especially today when we celebrate a Jewish way, our our wonderful parents, grandparents, and great grandparents. Uh, I uh, I'm just uh, recognizing today that there are not that many survivors left. And uh, yesterday I was talking to Hillel and I tried to quote him, and you probably know better the quote than I do, but what I get from it, that if, if, if not now, when? And if, if, if I am not going to do it, then, then who will? So it's really my duty. I owe it to my parents to let them know what happens when, when good people really do terrible, terrible things. And we're, we're here today to celebrate. Uh, and I am always just uh, in awe to people like you because you go beyond the me, me, me and the I, 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 that that's what it took in Auschwitz. All we had was each other then. And of course, all we have is each other now. So I feel very privileged uh, for you to call me a revolver. That's a wonderful way that I see myself. I get up in the morning and I, and I wonder, you know, how I can be useful to people. I don't ask ever, how can I help you? Uh, I'm not Humpty Dumpty, I'm not putting people together, but I hope to be useful to them. So I like to call myself a guide, that God gave me a second chance, not only survive, but also guide others. Because uh, that second word, F word, the from, surviving from, you know, from that feeling that you were locked in and you don't have any other choice but to give up. No, no, we even, I remember when cannibalism broke out in Gunskirchen in, in, in April 1945, I, I, I always ask people to watch The Sound of Music because, because I, there was this beautiful, beautiful place at the grass and, and I am looking up and asking God to guide me. And God told me just to look down and I had grass to eat. And even then, I remember choosing one plate of grass over against the other. So I can't is not in my vocabulary. You use the word, you say that the freedom is a power of choice and that you build your own prison and you trap yourself in your own mind. So can you just talk a little bit about that? Because it's so much about the work you do, the grief therapy and so forth. Yes, I, uh, but one thing I must tell you that uh, I had a boyfriend, Imre Friedman, Imre, and uh, we, were, we were very, 
very devoted Zionists, and we were going to go to Palestine, and we're going to fight. You know, we were very, very uh, adamant to, to really go to Palestine, so we had a goal together, and unfortunately, uh, he was killed a day before liberation, so, so that never happened. But we were very much in love and very much planning for the future. And when I was put in a cattle car, he said to me, I never forget your eyes and your hands. You have beautiful eyes. And I can tell you, in Auschwitz, I would go to you and everybody, tell me about my eyes, tell me about my hands. Because if I survive today, then tomorrow, tomorrow I'm going to see my boyfriend and show him my eyes. So that kept me alive, that even though I was told I'm never going to get out of here alive, I'm cancer to society, and yet I was able to listen and not say anything. But to myself, I said to myself, uh, uh, I know that you're wrong, and I know that you're the one is the prisoner, not me. I have my conscience. So today I know that it's good to talk to yourself, and it's very important when you are for something rather than against, against. I don't want that. I don't like that. And so I say, yes, I am. Yes, I can. Yes, I will. And believe me, Yes, you can choose one blade of grass over the other. So uh, the more choices we have, the less we feel like a victim. Victims will always find a victimizer. And I see that sometimes in marriage, that the victim becomes the victimizer, and I go back and forth and back and forth. And so I like to write a constitution for a family that they have rules, because if you don't have rules, you're going to have chaos. Yes, that was beautifully said. You say in your book, if you, if you live, you have to stand for something. To be passive is to let others decide for you. To be aggressive is to decide for others. And to be assertive is to decide for yourself and to trust that there is enough in you. So I thank you. Those words are so beautiful. So I, I was wondering if we could share a little bit about your t a story about when you were in Auschwitz. I know that you arrived at age 16 and you were asked mm -hmm. or forced, excuse me, asked is the wrong word. You were forced to dance for Dr. Joseph Mengele. Can you share mm -hmm. what that experience was like? What did you learn from that moment? On, are there other stories you would like to share with us today? Yes. Well, you know, he came to the barracks and he wanted to know who are the talented ones, that he wanted to be entertained. And let me tell you that I went to a Jewish school and my school teacher was with us. And she said to me, do as I told you, go, you know, and just push me in front of him and pretty soon I'm there. And so what I did, I closed my eyes and I pretended that the music was Tchaikovsky and I was dancing the Romeo and Juliet at the Budapest Opera House. And when I met Viktor Frankl, who really became my mentor, and uh, I, uh, I remember he said, you know, I closed my eyes and I pretended that I'm in a Vienna lecture hall lecturing about the psychology of, the, of, of Auschwitz. <laughs> and, and so we both used the same thing that we checked out and still were able to do what we were told and not to be against or try to touch even a guard. And many people did. They touched the guards and they got shot right away. So we learned very quickly that all we had was each other then, and of course all we have is each other now. So I consider it my duty to um, know that my parents didn't die in vain. You're right. Now you talked about in your survival, you were with your sister, 
and that your yes. sister, you understood that your sister had a responsibility to take care of you. And so you spoke so beautifully in your book about how you wanted to make yourself just vulnerable enough for her to feel she had a, a reason to survive every day. Yes, you know, uh, Magda was the pretty one in my family and Clara was the child prodigy and violin and my parents wanted a son and I came along. At the age of three, I became cross-eyed. So they took me for a walk and blindfolded me because they didn't want anyone to see what an ugly sister I was. And to top that, my mother told me very seriously, I'm glad you have brains because you have no looks. So, <laughs> so what happened if you ask my sister, who took care of who, she'll tell you she took care of me, and I will tell you that I took care of my sister. So I remember when we were completely naked, completely shaven, she looked at me and asked me, how do I look? And you know, Hungarian women are uh, pretty vain. And <laughs> so uh, I had a choice then, as you have a choice now, whether you choose how you're going to respond and not to react. Because right. when you react, you don't think. And I looked at Magda and I said, Magda, you have such beautiful eyes. And I didn't see it when you had your hair all over the place. So I ask people today, if you see anything at any time, ask yourself, is it very necessary and is it kind? because God gave us two ears and one mouth, so we would talk less and listen more. And so <laughs> that's, so it's, it's not what you lost, it's what is still here, honey. You're, you and I are still here. So it's not why me, it's what now. So there's a question that uh, very often is asked of Holocaust survivors as where did you find your, your strength? And do you feel it was there all along or did it develop during these horrifically challenging times? And did you have a mantra, a way of your daily routine that was helpful as you faced each day? I had a person um, who was my ballet master and uh, he told me a word that I didn't understand. He said that God built me in such a way that all my ecstasy has to come from inside out. But I didn't know, I didn't know what that meant uh, until I was in Auschwitz. And the other thing, when I was in a cattle car, my mom held me and said, we don't know where we're going. We don't know what's going to happen. Just remember, no one can take away from you what you put here in your own mind. And that's what I tell the children when I go to school. I, uh, I go and have a board uh, in, a, in a classroom and I, and I say, uh, I can't. And then I take the apostrophe and the T and, and I can, why? Because I think I can. I think I can, I think I can. So I think it's very important to tell you that uh, somebody I was working with went to a marathon and somehow halfway or so she, she stopped and she thought she's not able to, to continue. And then she, she came, she ran to my office. I did it, I did it, I did it what you said, and I said, what did I say? Yes, I am, yes, I can, yes, I will. So that's the mantra, yes, I am, not rather than, I don't want that, I don't like that. Right. You know, there is a difference between believing or faith. People tell me, I believe, I believe, I believe, but I like to know what kind of life you lead. So, so when, so when the communists came and they confiscated the business that was in my husband's family for many, 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 many years, they threw him in jail. And instead of saying, why me? I said, what now? And I took my big diamond ring. I went to the jail 
I, I uh, smuggled out my husband. We ended up at Rothschild in Vienna, and uh, there was a law that people who experienced the hardships and the Holocaust, they could come to America without any visa, and we, we qualified for that. So that's how we ended up in Baltimore, Maryland in 1949. Oh, I love the quote from your mother about no one can take anything away from what's in your mind. And I think that that's yeah. something that is felt in every yeah. page of your book. And so I, I'm very grateful you said that. So what inspired you to become a therapist in reading your book and the, and the case studies that are extraordinary? Can you share a little bit about yourself and how you came to the work that you do? Well, you know, when my mother told me, I'm glad you have brains because you have no looks, <laughs> I, 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 you know, you give them a name, you play the game. And I became a very, very erudite, very, very well-educated girl studying, studying, uh, studying and studying and studying. And then, uh, so I, uh, I was 40 when my supervisor said to me, you know, Edie, I did all the psychological testing. He says, you're not the person who work with things. You have to work with people. So I want you to go and get a PhD. And I said, it's impossible. I'm 40 now. By the time I get a doctorate, I'll be 50. And you know what he said? You'll be 50 anyway. And I think this is what I'm telling you. And you mentioned the crossroads, that there is no midlife crisis. There is a midlife transition. Right. You can, if you can go back to school and you know what? Get a law degree because we mothers are good judges. We always have to deal with our children, you know, who hit who and what, what and uh, so you may be uh, on a crossroads right now. And you may want to recognize our children don't do what we say, they do what they see. Right. You, yes. you write, which I thought was also a great line, um, the understanding if you blame others, you are still in the back seat. You need to help make yourself the driver of your own car, of, the, of your own road. So I thought Thank that you. was really, uh, so I was just wondering Maybe. how you use that in your therapy um, as a yeah. guide. Well, I used it something like, would you like to be a baby or a big girl or a baby or a big boy? And of course, they tell me I want to be a big girl. Because, well, you see, when you are in the back of the car, you can mess around, do whatever you want, because somebody is driving that car. So do you want to be driven or do you want to be the driver? Because there is no freedom without responsibility. It's anarchy. Right, right, right. So, so if you want to be the driver, there is no, there is no way right. that you're going to be able to do it from the back seat, and then you have to, must you really take the responsibility with the freedom. So yes. can you talk a little bit, just, I, I read that you have done, uh, You've, you've been a therapist for Navy SEALs in a lot of work that's dealing with post-traumatic stress. Um, yes. Perhaps you can just share a little bit of that with us. I found that fascinating in understanding your own life and being able to share that with your patients. I became very interested in, uh, in uh, is there anything good in, in everything? And yes. And yes, I began to really recognize that I, I did have a choice. I had a choice in Auschwitz. And then I, when I began to work with Navy SEALs, you know, they are kind of a different breed of cat. They have to do all kinds of things to become a SEAL. You have to walk and climb and crawl and very difficult to become a SEAL. Yeah. Actually, yesterday I had one and he married a Jewish wife, <laughs> and they belonged to the temple. So I, I, I had a very interesting session and told him that I am very proud to be a Jew because my ancestors didn't have it so good as we do, and that he also 
can become a wonderful father and a role model to his daughter the way he is loving the child's mother. So love is not what you feel, it's what you do, that you commit yourself to someone other than you, and that's what, you know, we practiced. Auschwitz was an opportunity for, for discovering what my ballet master told me, that the ecstasy will not come from the outside, that I have to create the world, and the, and the, and the more I suffered, the stronger I became. And yeah. so when people ask, where was God in Auschwitz? I say, God was with me. And God showed me how to change hatred to pity. And I began to feel sorry for the guards who were wearing that uniform and throwing children into the oven without even gassing them. And, and I think God was with me and God is with me. When I come home every day, I still drive. I'm thanking God in Hungarian to bring <laughs> me home safe. Yes, at 93, I am. Yes, I you am. Know, you mentioned uh, a little bit before we went on uh, about how your last Pesach before um, they came and took you yeah. away and deported you. So it made me think of Passover a little bit. And we talk about freedom and liberation, and we talk about freedom both psychologically and physically, right? I mean, it's not just the physical freedom, but it's the psychological. And I remembered in your book, you spoke about how at liberation, there were um, prisoners who walked out of the gates and then they came back in. They didn't, they were afraid of freedom and they had not psychologically at all been prepared for what to do with that responsibility. Can you share that about the idea of freedom both physically and psychologically? And that of course, you know, deals with post-traumatic stress patients as well. Exactly, you know, I, uh, my life uh, uh, was, uh, very interesting because I began to work with battered wives and help build <clears throat> um, living centers for wives who are beaten by their husbands. And guess what? They go back. Right. They go back because uh, he brainwashes her that without him, she's nothing. And that's exactly what happened to us. We were liberated. We went through the gate and pretty soon we would sit down and just wait. The person that you want to read about and uh, he's really the positive psychology person, Dr. Seligman. Uh, yeah. It's very important uh, about post-traumatic stress, not a disorder. You know, we, we, we pathologize too much. I like to demythologize. There is no perfect family. There is no Ozzy and Harriet on the TV, you know. And I think I think we have a a whole family within ourselves. So we yeah. leave over not what happened, but what didn't happen. When my granddaughter was uh, coming to me and asked me to buy her a dress so she can go to school to her dance. And I bought her a beautiful Ashley, uh, wonderful black velvet dress. And I came home and out of the blue, I was crying. I didn't understand, what am I crying about? The word understand, you know, is very academic anyway. Men do that, men always want to figure things out. We come from the heart. And so uh, I, uh, I didn't know what am I crying about and came to the realization that I'm not crying because I bought Lindsay a dance, beautiful dress. I cried because I never went to a dance. And that's how I created my theory about grieving, feeling, and healing. You cannot heal what you don't feel. Right. It's not clinical depression. That's you know, when a, a person comes to me and tells me I'm depressed, and I say, what's good about being depressed? And that person says nothing. 
And then I say, could it be that when you're depressed, you can get by with less? You may not have to wash the dishes. You may not have to take out the garbage that you don't want to do anyway. And then I see a little smirk on the face, you know, that uh, I know what you're talking about, that, you know, that every behavior satisfies the need. And that's why I ask people to think about their thinking, just my, what my mother told me, and pay attention what you're paying attention to. So pay attention what you're focusing on that is in alignment and gets you closer to a goal. And I like to call it an arrow, to follow an arrow. That when I came to America, I was on a ship called General House for displaced people. But then at the English Channel, we had a lot of bad weather. So I remember seeing the sheep moving somewhere else. But then he came back because we didn't go to China. We went to New York. And I hope that people can really find a way that no matter how difficult life is, you still have a choice to be a victim. Because if you're a victim, you're always going to find a victimizer. Right. In the beginning, that's wonderful. In the beginning of the book, The Choice, you talk about your belief that there is no hierarchy of suffering, a statement that you maintain after all you have been through. How do you put your own suffering on the same level as that of your patients, and uh, why is that important to you? Well, you know, um, I remember that uh, a woman came to me and told me, that she was touched inappropriately. But I don't know how to tell you, Edie, because you were in Auschwitz. And I said to her, I knew the enemy, and you didn't. Mm. So it's, you know, it's not comparable. It's not comparable. But suffering is feelings. And without feelings, we just go through the motions in life. And the more you suffer, the stronger. I became, and the more closer I became to God that is with me now, that's free spirit that tells me that uh, anything, anything that comes to my way, I choose to be for life and for making it and for being a survivor and never a victim of anything or anyone at any time. So you, as you say, you don't allow yourself ever to be trapped in your mind, and that's where you navigate your patience as well. It's extraordinary. The but prison in the, is in your own mind, right. and the key is in your pocket. Huh. In your book, The Gift, uh, which you published after the choice, at what age, 92, 93, oh my God, you created a guide to help people end destructive patterns and thoughts and to find freedom, as you just referenced. What made you write this particular book? You're such a brilliant, wonderful. No, 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 you are. I'm just able to, to learn from your words and to ask the questions. job. Actually, people were calling me, writing me, that they like the choice but they need something more practical. And, Self-help manual. <laughs> and that, yes, yeah. They want a how-to book, and that's how, that's how the gift came about. I the see. third book that is coming, hopefully, uh, my daughter and I are writing recipes. Recipes, oh. and so uh, I am a good Hungarian cook, but uh, my daughter is a gourmet cook, and, and so we're, we're putting a, a book together. But now I'm getting all kinds of calls to write a book for children, because oh. I, when I go to school, I tell the teacher, don't say Dr. Eager, just say Grandma is coming. Ah. Children listen to Grandma more than the mother. Well, I look forward to the book on recipes, that's for sure. So talking about grandma, how have you shared your stories and lessons with your own children and grandchildren? And why was this important to you? And what did you want them to know? Well, unfortunately, I did something that I wouldn't do today. 
I just went underground when I came to America. I didn't speak a word of English, and I didn't have six dollars to get off the boat. So I didn't even know how to, I didn't have any verbal capacity, and I didn't want people to feel sorry for me. So unfortunately, I had my secret, and I didn't tell anyone I was in Auschwitz uh, for close to 20 years. Wow. And the person who really helped me more than anything else was, was Victor Funkel's Man's Search for Meaning. Right. Have you ever read a book that you wanted to write 10 more pages? And that's <laughs> what I did. And, right. uh, and I published a paper, Victor Frankl and me, the little old me. And I got a letter from Victor Frankl from Vienna. He wants to meet me in San Diego at the uh, International University. And he was in his 70s. And he was mountain climbing and he was taking flying lessons. You know, amazing, amazing uh, uh, role model to me and then colleague as well. So I am very grateful. But he was in his 30s in Auschwitz. Right. He was a medical doctor and I was 16 in love. So we came in a different time in our, our lives. I was of course, dreaming that I'm going to meet my boyfriend. And he was pretending that he's lecturing in uh, Vienna about the concentration camp of Auschwitz. Wow. Well, you know, so many of the books that we know of, whether it's Primo Levi or Elie Wiesel or Viktor Frankl, have all been written by men. So it's so important yes. that your books are there and that we have your female voice um, to represent yes so many of the stories that you're sharing little bits of with us and to understand the resilience and de determination that was so prevalent with so many of the females in Auschwitz and Birkenau. So yes, I, thank I, you. Thank you. All we had was each other now. And it was really Philip Zimbardo who wrote the foreword in yeah. The Choice told me, Edie, you have something you have to do, whether you like it or not. We need a female voice exactly. because people who survived are famous are all men. Right. And so that's how uh, the choice uh, came. And I'm so happy that I can tell you that what comes out of your body doesn't make you ill. What stays in there does. In Hungary, we tell women, don't breathe into your breast. Somebody's great grandmother told you that in Hungary, and that is very true. My mother is so right. Think about your thinking, and uh, you recognize that what you think, you create. So I'd like to just ask you one more question, because there are a lot of people who would like to do a little question and answers, if that's OK with you. So my last question, which is relevant to right now, is you've shown incredible resilience during these challenging times of the pandemic, when a lot of people are feeling, low, you know, uh, isolation, loneliness, or trapped. Um, can you share a bit of advice or thought to help people build up their resilience during this time of isolation? I consider this isolation is what we have in uh, football. Time out. Time out. Maybe you have time to read another book. Maybe you have time to start writing your book. Maybe you have time to open up communication with your uh, soulmate. Maybe there is no such thing as going back. There is a new beginning. So think of yourself as being pregnant and you're gonna give birth to the you that was meant to be free. Free, free, free from your self-dialogue and using words like I always, I never. Instead, you say up till now I did this and now I'm going to do something else. Or in the past I did that and now I'm going to try something new. Do something every day what you have previously avoided. So my name is not a shrink. I am a stretch, you know. And Victor Frankl and I talked about 
how we can stretch people's possibilities and that I am not a victim, it's not my identity, right. it's what was done to me. There is a big difference, right. especially if you were touched inappropriately, you're still a virgin. And to be able to acknowledge that while you're angry, you suffer because anger has a lot of other emotion underneath and most of it is fear and fear and love does not coexist. So when you have fear, write them all down from the least anxiety producing to the most anxiety. And I may tell you, you can just take them, take them, take them, take them and check them off one by one. You don't need years and years of therapy for that because you were not born with fear. You were born with love and joy and passion for life. Mm, that's that's what I bring you. I and bring you the spirit. They right. bring you the spirit of a woman of strength, not a strong woman, a woman of strength who are carrying the ancestors that they never gave up ever. And I hope that you decide to be for something and self-love is self-care. It's not narcissistic. Right. No. This has been an extraordinary rich conversation and I can't thank you enough. I could go thank on and on and ask you many more questions, but I would like instead to turn it back to Tamar because she's got people who've already sent in their questions and she will facilitate some questions and your responses. So um, I turn it over to Tamar and I cherish every thank word you. you've just shared with us. Thank you, thank you so for much. your brilliant, knowledgeable company for me and I hope you'll see each other one day and give you a big, big hug. It's a deal. I'll come to San Diego. No problem. <laughs> okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. Okay. Thank you so much, Dorothy. We, well, we really dug deep into so many issues, but we have some more questions coming in. I want to encourage people. We have a bit more time, so please continue to send in your questions. So one question that we just got, um, Dr. Eager, is how can we move on from trauma when it becomes so consuming in life, um, and especially when you are in it. So a lot of people feel stuck in a trauma and how would you advise of moving beyond some of that? I, I don't give advice because the best advice is that advice. Uh, but I, I am a wonder woman. I kind mm -hmm. of look up and say, oh, I wonder what I could do when I was in your shoes. And uh, so I'm kind of like a museum guide. I, I put a few things out there, but I don't say this is what you do and that is what you do. But mm -hmm. grief, grief is not, not a, a clinical depression. And that's why what comes out of your body doesn't make you ill. What stays in there does. Mm -hmm. I usually, some people drive in to see me from Los Angeles and it takes a couple of hours to drive. And I, and, and I ask them to use that time to scream, to cry, and then laugh like a hyena, and you're going to feel better. That you uh -huh. use the time uh, productively. Because love is T-I-M-E. It's a four-letter word. Time. Time. Mm -hmm. And give yourself time in the morning to take charge of your thinking, take, take charge of your feeling, mm -hmm. and take charge of yeah. your behavior because none of the positive thinking does any good unless it's followed with a positive action. Thank you. I love how you said Wonder Woman because I first thought of the superhero, but then I love how you say Wonder Woman and. I think we all can wonder in our, be our own wonder woman or wonder man and ask our own questions like your and be curious about what we're going through to help us help us through. Very good, thank you. Um, another question came in, this is, as, a, as survivor numbers reduce, how can we continue to engage in these personal stories that help us find meaning in the past and respect and honor the past? You know, when I was liberated, I was put in a cast. 
and I could hardly speak because my lung was filled with water. Mm -hmm. And I got up in the morning and reality hit me. My parents didn't come back. Mm -hmm. I was told that my boyfriend was killed a day before liberation. So when I got up in the morning, I didn't say what. I said, what for? Mm -hmm. And that's the meaning and the purpose in life that I didn't have in a camp because I still had hope that if I survive today, then tomorrow I'm going to meet my parents, and that didn't happen. So you see, it's, we grieve over not what happened, but what didn't happen. And that's why when I bought my granddaughter a dress so she could go dancing, it's not because she went dancing, it's because I never went to a dance. Right. And one of the things we do a lot of the times, we use defense mechanisms like denial or minimization. It, was, it wasn't so bad. Other people suffered more. It's not, not really realistic. It's okay not to talk about feeling or medicate feeling, but to feel the feeling. Mm -hmm. So I go through the valley of the shadow of death but I don't camp there or set up household there. Mm -hmm. Part of me was left in Auschwitz. Mm -hmm. Part of me, but I never run anymore from the past as I did. And I'm much better off knowing that I still have charge the way I think about what happened. And I'm choosing to use the word opportunity for an opportunity not to recover, but discover the part of me that was able to look at life from inside out and not to mm -hmm. wait for someone to come and uh, liberate me. So I think, again, when you change your thinking, I think you can really change your life. Yeah, very good. I, I, it really resonates with me when you say not the why, but the what for, and thinking yeah. about how you talked about creating a mantra and how you had a mother that helped you create a mantra a little bit and, and other people in your life that helped you is this could be a mantra for others possibly of moving forward if people want to find their own mantra and take that from you and, and kind of change that, change that thinking in there. Yes, I am. Yes, I can. Yes, I will. So every day try something that you have previously avoided. Mm -hmm. Maybe well, a little Hungarian food. Okay, good. Dorothy, um, do you have some? Yeah, I do. Dr. Eager, I know that you made a decision to go back to Auschwitz, and when you approached your sister, she thought that was a crazy idea and didn't want to yes. do it. Can you explain uh, the difference approach and your experience there and what you shared with your sister when you came back? You know, I, I, I had a therapist, and I... I told my therapist to put me in a fetal position and not let me get up. And 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 uh, and uh, we did that, and then I decided I have to go back to that lion's den and look at the lion in her face. I have to go and reclaim my innocence and assign the shame and guilt to the perpetrator and begin to forgive myself that I survived. Mm. So that's why I went to Magda. And I said, you know, we lost our family. And I never went to a funeral. I really don't like myself when my friend tells me my mother died and she was 85 and I said to myself, big deal, big deal, my, my mother was in her for it. Um, and so I said, Magda, I like to go back to Auschwitz. And she says, you're an idiot, just like that. You're a masochist. So there is one thing I ask people not to repeat themselves. Just say something once because it's not effective. Because sometimes, you know, we look up and say to, to, uh, to Johnny, get off the roof, and the child doesn't listen because mm -hmm. you're going to 
we're going to raise your voice. By the fifth time, get off that roof, you can he hear me in Hungary. Uh, the, you know, you actually don't get any response the first time because we become like a broken record. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was a school teacher and I spent quite a bit of time negotiating what do you get in this class? What do you do to get an A? Mm -hmm. And after that, no excuse, death, yours. And you know what? I was named the best teacher because they knew that when they come to Mrs. Eager's class, she's going to be interesting. I was teaching transcendental meditation in 1969. I brought in guest speakers, the best in everything. I made it interesting. Mm -hmm. So be interesting and interested. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm not a shrink, I'm a stretch. And so you stretch your comfort zone and you stretch a way that you get to know and even try on a size of something that you never wore before. And uh, I used to take my daughter and bought her a dress and she would try it on and, uh, and she gave it back to me. And she would say, it's not me. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying, well, who, who is the you? So why don't you go and write down, I am? And usually women tell me, I need a man, Edie. And I say, if I were a man, I would run from you. So write down what you want from that ideal man, and you become that person. Whatever you practice, you become better at it. I am considerate. I am sensuous. I am responsible. Mm and practice every one of those every day. And then in the evening, give yourself a grade on it. I'm responsible. Is it A, B, C, F? You know, it's just mm -hmm. that you stop blaming because while you blame, you're still a child. Right. No more blame, only responsibility. That to me is extremely very, very, very important. So this, the two questions that I ask, uh, especially when you're a child of a survivor, because what happens, we parentize our children. I came to America. I didn't know anything about peanut butter. I never saw tuna fish in my life. And my children, uh, my, my daughter first was telling me that in America, you have to speak with a certain accent. And I spent three years at the university trying to get rid of my Hungarian accent. Mm -hmm. And as you say, <laughs> I am speaking with an accent, and I'm OK with it now. And so don't try to be you know, someone that you're not. But the second question is very interesting. So the first question, when did your childhood end? And the second question is, would you like to be married to you? Mm -hmm. I think about it because there is no going back. There is a new beginning. Mm -hmm. So tell your husband, I'm ready to have a love affair and I want to have it with you. Mm -hmm. Maybe he'll drop dead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Tamar, do you have and another question there? We do have a few more, and I know we have a few more questions, so we'll see what we can, what we're able to get to. Someone wrote in, um, what can I do to help my husband, whose father was a survivor? He's not aware of the continued trauma that he carries. Do you have any advice? Don't ask questions and don't give advice. <laughs> don't right. ever ask, how are you? They mm -hmm. say, fine, fine. Mm -hmm. Just say, gee, it's good to see you. I missed you. Stop doing what you're doing. Stop mm -hmm. and think and listen to your inner voice. Because if you want to have something in a bedroom happening, you want to be a sensuous woman, not sexy, 
sensuous, beautiful. And don't get into question, answer, question, answer. So don't ask, how are you? And don't say, why don't you? But you can just say, I would very much like to share with you my truth. See, there is no truth. It's all subjective. It's my truth and my sister's truth. So um, I, I think it's very okay to ask permission. I would like to. I would mm -hmm. like to share my truth with you, and uh, and the way I see what I would do if I were in your shoes. That's perfectly appropriate. But don't repeat yourself over and over again. But you are when you are having children you do what is best for your children. Mm -hmm. And a father is the best, the best role model to the child, the way he treats the child's mother, you. Very good, thank you. Um, and with our last two minutes here, I'll try to get one or two quick more questions in. Someone wrote, what advice or what message would you wanna to give to Jewish leaders and funders about where we should put our attention to meet the needs of our community and our world. As you know, um, the, our Jewish Funders Network, we're, we're about individual philanthropists and professional grant makers. And what message would you want them to, to consider as they wanna create more impact? I want to let them know that they are the heroes who do not just think about the me, 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 that they are givers and to give them a standing ovation and let them know that we take care of our brothers and sisters and that they are the best role models because love is not what you feel, is what you do. And mm -hmm. you thank them and hopefully this year they're going to double than what they did last year. Mm -hmm. And they can't say no to you ever and that you have to be a very good salesperson because, because Jewish people don't go on welfare, that I know that they really have wonderful ancestors who never give up and able to somehow become the people who give mm -hmm. rather than take. Yes. Tomorrow, yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. Tomorrow, I just want to say, uh, Thank, uh, Dr. Eager, thank you very, very, mm -hmm. very much. And yes, we do have a network of extraordinary philanthropists who step up all the time as they did this year with the pandemic and continue to find those points, rupture points in the pipeline of community to support and to better for all communities and underserved communities. So we are very proud of the work at Impact Jewish Funders Network has had. Um, and I want to say thank you again from the bottom of our hearts, also that everyone should read The Choice and the Gift. And I also just want to take this moment, without getting emotional, to, rep to acknowledge that my my mother, Esther Petersile, who's 96, happens to be on this Zoom call and has heard every word that you have said, Dr. Eager. So thank you again for sharing your stories with all of us and for being making Yom HaShoah today even more impactful. So thank you, thank you again. Thank and you. Tomorrow, thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy. Bye. Thank you so much for bringing so much of yourself to this interview. You could feel it through the screen and it made all the difference. And thank you so much, Dr. Eager, for spending your time with us, for the work that you do, for the books that you are putting out there and, and the message that you shared with us today. Um, we so appreciate it. And I, and I can talk for myself, but I think I can talk for everybody that's on the line, that they've been changed by your words and your, and your thoughts and, and your advice and your mantras today. So thank you all for joining and I'm um, looking forward to, to learning and networking with all of you again soon. Have a great day, everybody.